tales for dark nights. <laughs> well, hello boys and girls, it's me, the other half, and welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast, Season 1, Episode 6. I'm going to be your senior Washington correspondent for a special election edition of the Simply Scary Podcast. As of the release of this episode, we're in the home stretch of the 2016 American presidential election cycle. Many of us are beginning to get a sense of relief that this embarrassing national circus has come to an end. Either way, roughly half to two-thirds of the country is about to be profoundly disappointed. And a large portion of either team's supporters fears buyer's remorse. And it just so happens that we here at the Simply Scary Podcast specialize in fear. In honor of the momentous carnival-like atmosphere, we bring you an act from the freak show that reveals how, believe it or not, the situation could be much worse. But before we begin our horse race into terror, let us share a campaign commercial actually worth your time. All celebrity voices impersonated badly. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. <laughs> hey everybody, this is Bubba. If Hill wins again, I'll be partying in the White House like it's 1999 again. <laughs> now, if you want somebody to throw your support behind this November, help these boys and girls out of the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Give your support today by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com forward slash tour and join them today in spreading the dark around the globe. <laughs> Again, go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and give like you feel their pain. Help them turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> We're simply scary. And we approve that message. Now, let us begin. News of his impending death has left this individual feeling powerless and insignificant. As one who can only lash out in petty ways to curb his bitterness. But, when an old colleague comes to call, he brings with him an opportunity that may well make our unfortunate subject one of the most important people in human history and one of its most hated heroes. Master storyteller Otis Jiry takes the podium to bring us a terrifying tale from the Daylight Dim story collection. We present to you D.W. Gillespie's Man of the People. Crow sat half reclined in a mechanical bed with his knees up, and a sheet draped between them like the cables of a suspension bridge. He was old, but not nearly as old as he looked. The sprigs of hair that grew in a circle around the top of his head were short and almost downy. Months ago, when his hair first began to leave him, it had been a steely mixture of salt and pepper. Now all was an unwashed white with a yellowish tinge. 
His skin, always a few shades darker than most, was pocked with red sores, some of which were healing, others stubbornly refusing to. A thin rubber tube looped around each ear before meeting at his nostrils. Dr. Raven, a tall Indian man, strolled in with a dour look across his usually genial face. Mr. Crow, he said with perfect measured enunciation, there are some things we need to discuss. The flat TV screen, bolted to the wall overhead, displayed the second presidential debate, or maybe it was the third. Crow didn't really care, but it was the only thing on. The opponents stood across from each other, both clean-cut, both certainly reprobates of the highest caliber. So it was before me, so it'll be after me, Crow thought. Mr. Crow, Dr. Raven repeated, I've got the results back from the tests. Crow wrapped a skeletal hand around the remote and raised it. It was a bulky, clumsy thing attached to a cord connected to the bed. His bony thumb searched for the volume and he stared straight at the doctor as he notched it up as high as it would go. Then he turned his eyes back to the screen as if the doctor had never been there. Without hesitation, Dr. Raven reached up and unplugged the television. Watching that, Crow said with a voice like sandpaper. Without warning, he coughed in deep, painful bursts. Globs of blood flew into his mouth. He snatched a cup from the bedside table and spat into it. When he looked at his doctor, he still felt a small string of bloody saliva clinging to his chin. I'm afraid there is bad news. No kidding, Crow said sarcastically. The Red Sox lose? Mr. Crow, there is no easy way to say this, so I will not draw it out. We are out of options. The treatments didn't work at all, and the cancer has spread to your other lung. It is moving fast, very fast. So, what's next? The bite from his words was gone now. The doctor seemed to relax at the sound of his tired voice. Well... The conversation is no longer about treatment. Revan's voice remained calm. The conversation is now about time and comfort. There are a lot of options for... All right, Doc, let's cut the crap. How long? Dr. Raven sighed. Months, maybe less. But there are ways to improve your comf... Oh, shut up. You damn well know there won't be anything comfortable about this. So just do me a favor and shut up. Can I call someone? Call a cab for yourself. Go back to Pakistan, all right. Go screw a camel on a magic carpet for all I care. Just leave me alone. The doctor stared at his patient for a few seconds and let out another sigh. He walked out of the room. Crow focused his attention back on the television for a good long time, until the urge for a cigarette grew to be unbearable. The nurse caught him at the elevator, dragging his IV with one hand and clutching a pack of smokes in the other. Naturally, she objected. What exactly do you think is going to happen? He stared at her with his icy blue eyes until the firm hand of his elbow pulled away. Outside, he lit up and drew in the warmth of the cigarette. It burned wonderfully, and at once he fell into a fit of coughing so fierce that he didn't know if it would ever stop. A young couple strolled by holding hands and smiling. The wife cupped the underside of her pregnant belly. When they saw Crow, their smiles vanished, and they immediately crossed to the opposite sidewalk. You've always had that effect on people, a voice said over his shoulder, though that's probably truer now than it was a few months ago. Crow turned and saw a familiar but unwelcome face moving towards him. Oh, hell, Haynes, what do you want? Come to watch me die? Nice to see you too, Crow. Vincent Hades replied. His jet-black hair lay sharply to one side, 
He looked as if he had just walked out of a men's catalog, matching with an air of confidence. I see that your situation hasn't dampened your enthusiasm for bad habits. Is that how you sound when you talk to your wife? Crow pulled in another drag. Honestly, I can hear you in the bedroom saying, Well, tonight, I'm feeling rather randy, my dear. Perhaps you can fish my Johnson for my trousers for a good old-fashioned rooting. Haynes smiled, a careless thing, without a hint of offense. You're trying to get a raise out of me. You've always done that. I suppose dying shouldn't change anything. To answer your earlier question, no, I haven't come to watch you die. At least not exactly. After flicking the cigarette at Haynes' very expensive-looking shoes, Crow turned and headed back inside without responding. We're not done here. Actually, we are. The days of you telling me what to do are long gone. I'm here to offer you a job. Crow stopped. The light had nearly left the sky, so when he turned back, his eyes rested on Haynes' silhouette. You screwing with me? I assure you, I'm not. Crow lowered his head. Why do I get the distinct feeling you're pulling my crank for the way I treated you all these years? You got dozens of agents. No one needs an old timer with only a few weeks left on his time card. Actually, that's precisely why we need you. Your situation makes you the perfect candidate. He paused for a moment before adding... The only candidate. They stood in silence. When Crow began speaking, Haynes cut him off. There are hundreds of reasons not to do this, and I understand if you want to spend your remaining time in a more suitable manner. The truth is, he sighed as if the words inflicted physical pain, we need you. This is the biggest job any of us have ever been involved in, and We've only got one shot, one chance to get it right. Crow lit another cigarette, but barely took a drag before the full body coughing overtook him. The violent heaving nearly brought him to his knees, and when he looked back up, Haynes had taken several steps back. Don't worry, Haynes, he said, wiping the blood from his chin. I won't get any lung on your shiny shoes. Crow pulled himself slowly to his feet and leaned back, struggling for air. Screw this hospital. Screw cancer. Screw you. I said I was out. He turned back toward the hospital. There's a package waiting at your house. I suggest you take a look. You'd have played a crap, Crow yelled over his shoulder, and stay away from my damn funeral. The nurse came in as he pulled his now loose jeans over his skinny backside. The alarms in the room were blipping uncontrollably as a pile of cords lay uselessly upon the bed. Mr. Crow, you need to let us know if you want to leave the room. As much as I've enjoyed my stay, I'm afraid it's time for me to go. Mr. Crow, you're no in condition to... to live. Yeah, I heard as much. He continued dressing as she tried to change his mind, but it was wasted air. Things were the way they were, and although he appreciated her concern, there wasn't a thing on earth that would keep him in that room for another minute. The doctor sent him home with a portable oxygen generator, a bulky cylindrical gadget that pulled extra oxygen from the air. He realized in the car that it wasn't nearly the same as the real stuff, straight from the tap at the hospital, but it would have to do. By the time he made it to the kitchen, he collapsed into the first chair he stumbled across. He spotted the box sitting atop his kitchen table. There were no labels, no markings, nothing but cardboard and tape. They must have broken in, he thought. He briefly considered tossing it onto the floor and stomping it to pieces, the truth was, he couldn't. No matter how long he held out or how hard he fought, he wouldn't be able to die in peace until he knew what was inside. Crow drew a small folding knife from his pocket and sliced into the top. After brushing aside some crumpled newspaper, he found a gun. It was a very short, double-barreled shotgun. 
the type mobsters called a lupara. The entire length was 15 inches long. He thumbed the action, and the barrels cracked open to reveal empty chambers. Crow closed the barrels with a flick of the wrist, and the metallic crack echoed around the empty apartment. Crow dug a little deeper. He pulled out two shotgun shells, both smooth and jet black. Upon inspecting one of the copper rims, he noticed a single letter pressed into the metal. V. Crow sneered and coughed again. Setting down the two shells he dug for the others that surely must be there, it wasn't until the newspaper circled his feet in crumpled heaps that he realized that two was all there was. The hell? Only a large plastic envelope remained. He already knew what was inside and fetched a black light. It was one of several such lamps placed throughout the house. Crow tore open the top of the envelope and slowly pulled the picture out. As always, the front showed the target. The back showed vital information, such as name and address. To his surprise, the back sat totally blank. What the hell? After turning the picture over in his hand, his mouth dropped. Crow was many things, but he was not easily shocked. He had seen more in his years than most men, but nothing could have prepared him for that. The picture showed a man in a sharply tailored suit, flanked on either side by equally dressed men of various age and race. Without a second thought, he turned on the UV lamp and held it over the photograph. The man in the center of the picture began to glow an unearthly blue. No damn way. Vincent Haynes hung on to the edge of his heated pool. It was his morning ritual. Thirty minutes in the balmy water every day of the year, weather permitting. The sun had only been up for about fifteen minutes, and the steam still rose from the blue surface, twisting in casual loops that disappeared into the cool morning air. Vincent, I'm heading up to work. All right. Lunch? Haynes asked his wife. There was a shuffling and giggling inside the house as his wife gathered her purse and their infant daughter. I, I don't think so. I'm still pretty slammed. Tomorrow, maybe? Yeah, that'll work. Love you guys. We love you, too. Haynes stepped out of the pool and began to dry off. A sudden chill ran up his back at the unmistakable cold of a gun. I didn't hear you come in, Ann said, wrapping a towel around his waist. They never do, Crow hissed in his ear. What the hell is this? Haynes turned and stared at the picture shoved into his hand. Why do you still have this? He said with a sudden sharpness. You know protocol. Screw protocol and screw you. Crow pressed the barrel to Haynes' forehead. You and the agency getting one more in before I croak? Is that what this is? Haynes smacked the gun aside. You planning on shooting me? You think I won't? You honestly think I have anything to lose? All at once, Crow began to hack and wheeze, and the gun dropped uselessly to the concrete. Neither of us have time for this, Haynes said. The coughing faded, and Crow looked up, staring at his former employee with true hatred. Did you UV the picture? Of course I did, Crow replied. You faked it. Why exactly would I do something like that? You think I really have time to mess with you? You were important to the agency, but not that important. Crow flipped on the oxygen compressor slung over his shoulder and fixed the tube into his nostrils. It's a fake, he said, breathing deeply. It has to be. What's on that picture is impossible. No, not impossible. A highly unlikely worst-case scenario, but not impossible. Crow picked up the gun and flipped it open, staring at the V on the back of the shells. V-load, he said as he drew one of the shells out. I know you were more of a desk jockey, but even you know... Must know what's in here. Haynes took the shell and held it out between two fingers. 
A dozen wood flechettes, about an inch and a half long, and each one soaked in garlic oil. Once they're packed, you fill in the rest of the shell with silver shavings. Effective kill range of about 10 feet, but one of these can seriously injure a target up to 30 feet. The perfect round to kill a vampire. That's exactly why I designed it. And now you're telling me to use it on him? On one of the two men running for president? Inside. That's what I'm telling you. How the hell did this all happen? I've been killing monsters for the government for over 40 years, and I've never seen anything like this, Crow said, sitting at Haines' dining room table. Haines stood at the bar and poured a double scotch for each of them. I know, it's a little early for booze, he said as he swirled the dark liquor in a glass. I'll be dead in weeks, Crow croaked. Early don't mean much anymore. The picture sat on the table in front of him, and he studied it intently. I still can't imagine how this could happen. Hayes sat down across from him and sipped his drink, grimacing as he did. I've been following this for a few years now, and there are days that I don't believe it. The agency has been tracking this whole situation very closely. Trust me when I tell you that you're not the only agent involved. If you were on it, how did it get this far? I'll get there, but it goes back a lot further than you might think. Do you remember a target named Philip Knox? Crow rubbed his bristled chin for a moment. Doctor, right? That's the one. Jesus, that was probably 15 years ago, Crow said. More like 20. We had a lot of intel on him back then, but we never knew the full story. Based on medical records, Knox was supposed to die around 85, cancer like you. It was bad enough for him to go ahead and make final arrangements. Lucky for him, he had a sudden turnaround. Miracle drug? Crow asked, sarcastically. You could say that. Someone turned him, but all signs point to it being a mutual arrangement. We still don't know who it was, but they wanted something from him. They wanted a doctor with a very specific interest. Such as... Eugenics. Knox wrote half a dozen articles for medical journals on the subject. Some of it is really controversial stuff, borderline crap that can give people bad ideas. Like Hitler? Crow mused. Maybe worse, like a vampire with deep pockets. Regardless of who turned him in, he began to work closely, exclusively, for a company called Horizon Enterprises, around 1989. There, he focused on R&D, the public details of which uh, I won't bore you with. What I can tell you is how they caught the agency's attention. They were based out of San Francisco, a city with a high homeless population that began to mysteriously drop in the early 90s. Talking heads will prattle on about social systems and safety nets, but we knew better. Someone was taking them off the streets, and once we started looking, it didn't take long to trace it back to the good doctor. We? Crow asked with a bit of uncharacteristic good humor in his voice. Were you even alive then? Not that that matters, but I had just started with the agency around the time you took care of Knox. He glared at Crow and added, Pardon me for not being as tenured. Oh, unwind your panties and keep talking. There was enough research done into Horizon to realize that it wasn't just a cover. There were people working there, a lot of them who probably had no clue what happened after hours, especially at the upper echelons. It was decided that taking Knox out would be enough to put the brakes on whatever was being planned, and for a while it did just that. Did you ever actually see any research? Not much. Not until much later. Did you have any idea what he was up to? No, but we knew it was related to eugenics and eventually genetics. There were some notes that hinted at some kind of long-running vampire breeding plan, but they weren't complete. At the time, no one was able to put the pieces together until three years ago, that is. Crow cleared his throat and then drained the rest of his glass. Can I smoke? Is that wise? Haynes asked. Not really, he said as he lit up. What happened three years ago? 
An agent killed a vampire moving a shipment of blood up from Mexico, and he found GPS coordinates to a place in West Virginia, only there was nothing for a ten-mile radius at that location. It turned out to be the start of a dirt road that led to a very remote facility in West Virginia. I'm talking off the grid completely. The outer structure was painted green to match the forest, and the majority of the floor pan uh, was buried underground. They really didn't want to be found. No kidding. We sent a crew in and raided it, and it took months to sort through the research there. Turns out that killing Knox barely put a dent into the program, but we could finally see the entire scope of things. He had identified over 30 hereditary variables specific to vampires, everything from eye color, strength, allergies, and one very important piece of the puzzle, aversion to sunlight. Oh, I'll be damned. Before you killed him, he discovered that certain vampires could withstand exposure to the sun for longer periods than others, and after twenty years of infecting, breeding, and even genetic manipulation, the Horizon Group had finally created their masterpiece. A vampire that is immune to sunlight. Holy hell. Well said. Haynes refilled their glasses. They could make an army and take over. That seems to be what they've always wanted. You're right. But we caught wind of everything before it got that bad. What we stumbled upon in West Virginia was still phase one. At that point, there were only three of them, all born from a single vector, a mother. He shuddered as he said the last part. Mother. All of those years of breeding and testing came down to a single focal point. An absolute abomination. Haynes paused and took another sip from his drink. I was there, and after they cleared out the fodder, they found it. No one knew what to do. They wanted a desk jockey to make the final call, so they picked me. Haynes drank down what was left in his glass and set it down on the table. Even now, it's hard to say what it was originally. They kept it in a cage, sort of hunched over like a dog. It was hairless, toothless, and eyeless. Didn't even have holes for ears. I don't even think it was actually conscious, at least not exactly. It flinched if you hit the cage, and it would lap up anything that fell on the floor, but that was it. There were tubes coming out from around its spine, removing fluids, raw genetic material. These were used to create the serum. When injected into a human, they would turn it into a vampire like no other. Based on the notes, they tested it on dozens of candidates before they got it right, and the effects were disastrous. Eventually, they cracked it, and when they did, they knew it was precious and damn hard to recreate. They had to choose the right candidate for the change. I wonder now if maybe they knew how close we were to finding them. What happened to the mother? Crow asked. V-load, decapitation, gasoline, every single shred of DNA had to be destroyed, and I made sure it was. Crow pointed to the picture. If he's one, who were the other two? Both were test subjects that worked at the facility. A first test and a backup. Both were killed and ID'd after we went in. They knew the little serum that remained was more precious than anything that any of them had ever done, so they made sure it went to the right person, a rising star who had already been using his clout to further their causes, a man who wanted to be a vampire and to hold the highest office. He's the only one left. Are you sure? Crow asked, his voice rising as he finally understood the enormity of the situation. Are you absolutely sure? We confirmed everything. The Horizon Group is dead. All the loose ends have been tied and retied. The only thing left is him. Crow leaned back and took another sip before tipping his cigarette into his glass. He coughed once and wiped his mouth with the back of his sleeve. It's just one guy. What can he really do? Haynes sighed. We don't know. And that's what scares the hell out of us. Maybe he can't do anything. Like most presidents, he might be too tied up in war and politics to do a thing. But imagine the possibilities. Despite everything we do, the vampire underground is stronger than ever. 
What if he becomes the first president to start legalizing all the drugs we supposedly fight against? The agency dwindles and they start to take over. What if he opens the borders to more traffic from Mexico? All of a sudden, we would be overwhelmed. But most importantly, what if his DNA is the key to restarting Horizon? That's what really scares me. An army of vampires walking around in the sun. Crow thought about this and said, All right, I get it, but why me? Haynes leaned back and struggled with his words. What do you want me to say? That you're one of the best? That you're the right man for the job? That you're the only one that can get it done? All of those things might be true, but I think you know the real reason it has to be. Crow's best sarcastic smile rose at the edges of his mouth. Because it's a one-way trip. Haynes nodded solemnly. I've tried to pull strings with the Secret Service to find a good time to make a hit, but it's too far gone for that. If we reach any farther, we'll expose the agency, and we can't do that, not even for this mission. If it happens, it has to happen without any extra intervention on our part. So you're asking me to commit suicide? No, I'm asking you to do what's right. Crow stood and turned toward the window. The sun shined on the perfectly manicured lawn, and he couldn't help but think about his own apartment. So shabby, so simple, so much less. You know what they gave me for my retirement? After 35 years in the case of lung cancer, I got a gold pocket watch. It's a nice one, too. He turned back to Haynes. I fought these monsters for the better part of my life, and all I have to show for it is a watch that costs about the same as your television set. What the hell do I care about what's right? Crow, please... You know what'll happen if I do this? Every person I've ever known, including my daughter, who wants nothing to do with me, will think I was sick. Not just a degenerate, but a degenerate with a diseased mind. The cops will raid my house and find all my weapons, guns, and knives, all the tools of the trade. The tools of your trade, I should say. And they'll all go, I knew something wasn't right about him. He just kept to himself a little too much. He was probably some kind of pervert. Two. No, that won't happen. Oh, but it will. For months, they'll show my picture on every screen they can fit it on, so the world can see the monster. The damn monster. And then they'll go on to proclaim the real monster a hero, a martyr, a beacon of hope for all of us. And for years, he will be spoken of with reverence and pride, a true paragon. I won't even be the crap on the bottom of his shoe. Does that sound just about right to you? Haynes said nothing. It's screwed up, Crow said plainly. And I wouldn't mind punching you in the mouth, but that don't mean I won't do it. I, I, I don't know what to say. I didn't propose, you dandy little jerk, and I didn't say I would do it either. I want to hear the plan first. I guess there's no point in arguing, Haines said as he stared into Crow's old stony face. I meant what I said earlier, when I told you we don't have much time. There's really only one shot. He'll be in Atlanta in three days for a town hall meeting. Usual fluff stuff, mainly just his supporters around to sing his praises, while the press take pictures. We've got the flight, hotel, and rental car already prepared for you. As security... For general public, not too bad, but if you want to get close, it'll be stiff. That's where you'll have to improvise. Crow stood up and slung the oxygen compressor over his shoulder. Send me the stuff. So you're in? Crow stopped at the door. Don't know. Watch the news, and if I were you, I'd work on a contingency plan. Crow spent the rest of the day drinking. Around three o'clock, someone knocked, but by the time he stumbled to the door, he only found an envelope that had been shoved underneath. The night moved on in a drunken spin. Empty beer cans littered his apartment floor like fallen leaves. Shortly after midnight, he passed out with a revolver clasped tightly in his right hand. The hammer cocked. 
The idea had been to get drunk one last time, but the results left something to be desired. Crow woke gasping for breath, sure he had broken some ribs at some point. He rolled onto his back and gulped at the open air, an invisible weight lying on his chest. The feeling didn't leave him until he pulled himself clumsily into his recliner and turned on his oxygen. It was the closest he had ever come to dying, and the feeling shocked him deeper than he could have imagined. He rested in the chair until almost noon. By then, his breathing had normalized. What a crappy life this is, he said as he finally groped his way into the kitchen. Good thing I'm dying. He laughed as he fished a slice of cold pizza from the fridge. By six o'clock that night, Crow had been staring at the phone for nearly two hours. She'll be home by now. I know that much. She'll be home, but he won't be yet, so now's the time. I'm going to do it, now's the time. He lifted the phone and stared at it, something he'd done half a dozen times by now. Don't set it down again. Don't you freaking do it. Crow forced his fingers through the numbers as fast as he could. The droning ring sent a chill down his back. Hello? A man's voice answered. Mark? Crow replied in the most amiable voice he could muster. Yes, who's this? It's, it's Mr. Crow. There was a long, empty pause. Your father-in-law. Oh, look, Elizabeth isn't here. There was a shuffling on the line, followed by the muted sounds of voices too faint to make out. She's working late tonight. I can tell her you called. Put my daughter on. I told you she's not here. And I told you to put her on the damn phone. I'm not playing with you, you prissy little twerp. I swear to God, if I have to drive down there, I'll beat you until you're... Dad! It was the first time in three years that Crow had heard his daughter's voice and his eyes immediately stung. Liz, he said in a shaky voice. I, uh, hi. Dad, I thought we agreed you wouldn't do this anymore. Her voice was stern. I know, it's just that, well, there's some things going on with me, and I needed to let you know. There's nothing you can say now that can make up for the things you said when Mark and I got married. I don't expect you to change your mind, Liz. I just need to tell you something. No one calls me Liz anymore. No one has called me that in ten years. Crow paused for a long time. You're still Liz to me. Her answer was sudden, direct, without a moment of hesitation. I don't want to hear from you anymore. Not now. Not ever. The phone went dead, and he sat in the fading sunlight spilling in through the bedroom window feeling more empty and older than he ever had. When the sun was gone, he found a forgotten fifth of bourbon in the back of a kitchen cabinet. The bottle was half full, and he belted it down within minutes. At some point in the night, Crow found himself behind the wheel. It played like a VHS tape that had started in the middle. He couldn't, for the life of him, remember getting in the car or turning out onto the highway. Could have been killed, he thought to himself, and the idea made him double over with laughter. Crow knew exactly where he was headed, and there was only one reason for going there. He stopped the first hooker he crossed, something he never did in the past. But now diseases didn't seem too pressing of an issue. She stepped into his truck, and they drove. What you looking for? she asked. You got a menu? he replied, laughing. They passed under a streetlight as he glanced over at her, seeing a glimpse of her for the first time. To his amazement, she was smiling, a toothy, decaying smile. You a case, ain't you? She replied with good humor. That I am, sweetheart. I know a place up here, she said, motioning to an empty, darkened lot. Once in the parking lot, she turned to him. So, uh, let's talk business, she quoted the prices and services, Taking them off with her fingers. Crow leaned back and smiled. Hmm, he said with a smirk. Might just have to go with a sampler platter. He reached into the glove box for a roll of cash. Money is no object, my body lasts. 
A sudden splash of moonlight hit her face and Crow felt silent. Without any real warning, he was thrown backward. Back through the pain and the years of the soul-crushing regret. All at once, it wasn't the stringy-haired hooker in the passenger seat next to him. It was his wife. Maybe it was the way the moon hit her face, or maybe it was the faint scent that hung on it. The subtle smell of perfume or deodorant. A scent that was achingly familiar. Or maybe he was just a dying old man whose mind refused to be trusted. The reasons didn't matter. Here, he said, handing her money. She thumbed through the stack, and when she realized they were all hundreds, her eyes cut back to him defensively. Now, I don't do no crazy stuff. I got kids. Please don't make me do no crazy stuff. Just get out, he said. Her eyes grew large, and tears welled up at the edge of him. Don't kill me, please. Don't kill me. Crow reached across her and opened the door. I'm certainly a piece of crap, lady, just not that kind. As the prostitute fled into the night, Crow drove away slowly, stopping just once at the liquor store. The next morning, Crow's pillow was dark brown from blood. He stared at it, wondering how much he'd lost, and when he stumbled into the bathroom, he wasn't surprised to see the sallow, sunken shade of his skin. He looked dead already, and the way things were going, he would be by the end of the week. There was nothing left for him, not that there had been much to begin with. It took a few hours to gather his supplies and load his trunk with his tools. By nightfall, he was in Atlanta. When Crow checked into a hotel, he sent a suit out to be cleaned with the guarantee that it would be ready first thing in the morning. He hated wearing suits, but this one was sharp. It was a single-breasted navy blue job that made him look as respectable as any other man at the town hall. Crow spent most of the night in his hotel room with his tools spread out on the table. He brought a bag packed to the brim with everything he could possibly need, and he immediately set to work. For years, he had been good with his hands, and even though they shook harder than ever, they refused to let him down. The only break he allowed himself was long enough to order a steak, the biggest one that room service could bring. In the early hours of the morning, when the work was done, Crow wondered whether or not the thing he built would get the job done. Either way, he said to himself, either way. Crow checked his reflection in the mirror. He barely recognized himself. His face was clean-shaven for the first time in a month, and though his suit was as sharp as ever, it clung to his old bones like they were draped over a coat rack. It was the thinnest he had ever been. The last thing he did was pull out a notepad, removed a square of the white paper, and sat down on the edge of the bed. It didn't take long to write what he wanted to say. Let's do it, he said as he slung the oxygen tank over his shoulder. After tipping the cab driver a hundred, he stepped out at the convention center. Damn buddy, the driver said. Thanks, I hope you get to feeling better. Crow laughed. You know something? Dying is damn tough. The walk up to the center almost did him in. He was forced to stop in a long flight of concrete stairs to fit the oxygen tubes into his nostrils. The crowd parted around Crow. Some glanced, feigning concern but no one tried to stop him as he made his way through the sea of people. Once he made it into the center, Crow truly believed he would keel over then and there. With each new breath, his lungs expanded a little less. It felt as if his shirt grew tighter by the second. He leaned against the wall, coughing and wheezing, completely unable to catch his breath. Finally, one of the staff spied him and approached cautiously. Sir, are you all right? Crow dug deep and spoke. No, sir, I'm not all right. He took a deep breath and tapped into his few remaining reserves of charm and hoped it would be enough. And I won't be all right until I know our country is headed in the right direction. I'm sick, awful sick. But I've come to see the man that could save the country I love while it's still worth saving. And if I get the chance to shake his hand, well, sir... I think I could die happy. 
The growing smile on the young volunteer's face told Crow that even at death's door, he still had it. The volunteer led him into a queue of people, all passing through a strenuous security check. After a short wait, Crow was asked some personal information, which an attractive young girl entered into a laptop. There was a short pause as the computer ran his information. Then she gave a quick smile and allowed him to proceed. In the past, before computers became quite so ubiquitous, he would have been worried, but not anymore. The agency wasn't good for much, but you could count on them to cover the fake IDs. Thanks for coming, Mr. Jacobson. It'll take a minute to get through security, but after that, we'll have a seat for you near the front. Thank you, my dear. Crow smiled kindly. That's right, he thought. Just another old grandpa here. Nothing to worry about. He counted a dozen security men, all in dark suits and wearing sunglasses, except for a single dark-haired young man holding a wand. As Crow walked through the gate, the alarm began beeping. Oh, my, he said. I suppose it must be my belt. Raise your arms, the guard said. Crow did as instructed. The guard swept the wand up and down. He settled briefly on the oxygen condenser before lowering the wand, apparently satisfied. Each breath was so shallow that Crow was seeing black blotches in front of his eyes before he sat down in his assigned seat. It was the front row, just off center of the action. As he eased down, his vision began to clear. Sir, are you okay? He nodded at the boy. Fine. Just need to catch my breath. Crow leaned on his elbow and focused on breathing until a spasm of coughing assaulted his momentary calm. The handkerchief he kept in his pocket was soaked with blood by the time it stopped, but he quickly stuffed it away. A sudden blur of movement and deafening applause added to the overwhelming confusion Crow felt. Then excited voices coming through the speakers blended with cheers from places unseen. Here he is, our next president of the United States, a true man of the people. There were splashes of color that darted in and out of the gray arena, and a voice louder than the others rose above the din. Crow tried to keep his focus, but so much was happening at once. He let himself fade into his memories. Liz, he muttered. Something black stirred around the rafters, and occasionally a smoky tendril stretched down and brushed across the audience like a hand drawn across the tops of a wheat field. Crow rubbed his eyes, and it was gone. Suddenly, there was a hand on his shoulder. He was being lifted up, helped to his feet, and even in that stupor, he managed to smile. Do you want to talk? the usher asked. Crow's eyes focused just long enough to see the same young man that greeted him at the front door. I think we would all love to hear from you. Crow had never been more confused in his life, but then a euphoric moment of lucidity washed over him. The sights and sounds melted away, and there was only him and the job. In thirty-five years, he had not missed a target. He stood up as straight as his aching insides would allow. The usher led him down a few stairs to the empty microphone waiting at the bottom. A woman in her fifties had just finished asking a question, and the candidate was just now wrapping up with his winding answer. You'll be next, a man told Crow. Just step up to the mic and share your thoughts. It'll be positive, right? Crow flashed his slyest smile. Absolutely. The crowds clapped, thousands of faces turned toward him, and everything fell silent. This is it, Crow thought. Did you have a question, sir? The candidate, the enemy, the catalyst that could change the world, asked him. No, Crow said, suddenly aware of how weak his voice sounded. Not a question, just a statement, if you'd listen. Of course, I'll always listen to the American people. I knew you would. Crow took a deep breath and tugged uneasily at the tube in his nose. I've been a public servant for thirty-five years. I've worked hard almost every day of my life. And I've sacrificed a lot to do my job well. 
It was a job that a lot of people wouldn't have wanted to do, but I tried not to complain too much. He took a breath, then continued. Now I'm sick. I don't have much more time. Here, at the end, I can't help but wonder what all that work was for. I've always thought that we go out what we put in, that the world we fought for was the world we found waiting for us. He stopped to breathe once more. But that promise didn't come true, not for me at least. I'm at the end and I don't have much of anything. He scanned the room for a moment, realizing he didn't have much else to say but knowing that his work wasn't done, not just yet. But I have to say one thing. Before I die, I want to know that the America I grew up believing in will be in good hands. I want it to be like it was, and I know you're the man to get us there. I don't have much left to believe in, but I can honestly say that I believe in you. The crowd erupted, and the candidate nodded his head, smiling all the while. When the applause died, he followed up with a mini-speech of his own, thanking Crow for his contribution and assuring him that his work and hope would not be in vain. The usher took Crow's shoulder once more and led him back to his seat. That was amazing, the young man whispered in his ear. I'll bet you make the national news. I'd put money on it, Crow snorted. The people around him were still clapping, still bobbing their nods of approval as he took his seat among them. A hand gently settled on his shoulder and he glanced back to see a white-haired man leaning in close to him. Jesus is with you, brother, the man said. Crow stared from the hand up to the man's eyes. Get that hand off me before I shove it up your backside. The hand slowly slid away. Time passed. Crow faded in and out, hardly there. Then he was on his feet, pushed forward by the throng, urged up to the edge of the crowd. The candidate was passing by the aisle, shaking hands, smiling for cameras. Crow tottered, barely standing, barely breathing, barely living. The world was a tapestry of voices and faces, most unfamiliar, but some long lost, long dead, long gone. Still, he was urged forward, closer and closer, until he was next in line, so close to the candidate, he could smell his aftershave. A hand thrusted towards him, as welcoming and warm as any old friend. Crow looked from it to the beaming face of the candidate, no doubt pondering the mileage the picture could generate. Crow had slaughtered hundreds of beasts before, but never had he shaken hands with one. He slapped his hand into the candidate's and shook firmly. Then he pulled him close, so close, his mouth was inches away from his ear. The million-dollar smile never faded, and they looked like two old buddies sharing a joke. The oxygen condenser lodged in between the two of them, and the top pressed into the candidate's chest. Crow slipped aside the false bottom from the casing he had hollowed out the night before, he drew his target closer with his right hand. With his left hand, he found the handle of the double barrel resting in the tank. He pressed it up toward the top of the condenser. You know what's funny? He asked the creature in front of him. There are fools in this world who actually think their lives make a difference. The candidate pulled back, his smile fading as the two men parted. Crow tilted the condenser down toward the vampire's heart. Can you believe that? He asked, grinning as he pulled both triggers. The back of the candidate's immaculate suit exploded into confetti, and blood splattered onto everyone within a ten-foot radius. Splintered wood and shaved pieces of silver shredded the vampire's heart, and the candidate was dead before he hit the ground. Secret Service agents were on Crow, but none of them opened fire like he thought they would. Instead, they dove on him, pinning him on the ground. He felt knees all over his back, elbows across his neck. Rather than fight, Crow simply closed his eyes. Let's get this over with, he thought. 
In normal cases, there might have been questions of police brutality. Crow's, however, was no normal case, and there was little doubt that the severity of his cancer had contributed greatly to his death by asphyxiation under half a dozen Secret Service agents. Even without the cancer, no one would have shed a tear for him. Crow became the kind of freak that the world couldn't get enough of. A man that hated God and country. A total anarchist whose story could only end in such a brutal way. Anyone close to him was hounded by the media for months after the assassination. The candidate became a firebrand for the country, a symbol of true patriotism. Bridges between the two parties were mended as every elected representative united in hatred of the man named Crow. In the end, every detail of that sad slice of American history was accounted for, catalogued, and drawn out to its absolute extreme. Every detail except for one. After Crow had left his hotel room, an employee of the agency had entered at Haines' request. He had removed a note handwritten on a piece of hotel letterhead. The note had been delivered to Haines, who had instructed it to be delivered to the home of Elizabeth Wilcox, formerly Elizabeth Crow. The note read, Liz, I could never convince you or anyone else, but what I did was the right thing to do. That doesn't matter, though. I just wanted you to know. I'm sorry. Crow. Of course, in real life, a far-fetched situation, such as a non-human entity taking control of the highest office in the land, would never happen in real life. Not when we have the vigilance of the shadowy Illuminati and the Freemasons. You may not see it, but I'm covering one eye in deference to those who must not be named. It's time to speak truth to power with this quick message before we reveal more of our own dark truth about how you can be a part of Simply Scary and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay, okay. Man, it's dark in here. I can't see anything. Oh, oh god. that thing. Okay, let's see. Info. Gotta find some info. Hiya, Chad. What you looking for? Oh, God. Oh, God, it talks. Yeah, that's right. I talk. So what are you doing sneaking around in the other half's office what? when he's not oh, here? I'm, I'm just looking for it. I'm looking for info on, uh, on Daylight Dims. Oh, the book series that the story in today's episode is featured in? Yeah. Oh, the best way to find Daylight Dims is to go to daylightdims.com or purchase it on Amazon.com. You wouldn't want me to be disappointed now, would you? No. No, 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 I'll go there. I'll go there right now. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Go to daylightdims.com and I can find it on amazon.com, right? At Daylight Dims. That's right. And since you did that, I don't really need you for the commercial anymore. What commercial? <laughs> So, if you want to find out more about Daylight Dims, 
Don't be sneaking around in my office, where Archie lives. You can go to DaylightDims.com and find out more information, or you can find the collection at Amazon.com. Be sure to check out some of the stories featured in Daylight Dims on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube. Once on YouTube, just search Daylight Dims Chilling. Now, back to the show. Welcome back, listeners. Now, stay alert for these important announcements. Otherwise, I've got an industrial staple gun to make sure your ears are open. Good, now that I've got your attention. Let us begin by directing you to our website, simplyscarypodcast.com, for more information on today's author, D.W. Gillespie. This Tennessee author has been featured in several anthology collections, both in print and online. Look for his newest work, Handmade Monsters, to debut in 2017. When not enjoying his family and pets, he lies in bed dreaming of frighteningly fantastic new ways to disturb you. Find out more on him and the story collection he is featured in by going to simplyscarypodcast.com and click on About. And from the drop-down menu, choose Featured Authors to read more about Mr. Gillespie. You can find all his available works on Amazon.com, which you can conveniently link to from his Simply Scary Author page. Now, you can also use the Daylight Dims link from his Simply Scary Author page to purchase the Daylight Dims Story Collection from Amazon.com, featuring several stories produced by our friends over at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Audio Productions. Check it out today, or I'll be under your bed with that aforementioned staple gun. Now comes the time when we select a review to read on air and receive a special prize from the Chilling Tales website. For this episode, our winner is... What? Oh, you want to read it. Hey, everybody, let me introduce you to Archibald Carlisle. Hi, folks. You may have seen him pop into the live stream that we had on Halloween night over at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. That's right. Hey, hey, Jeffrey, I'm coming for you. No, that wasn't creepy at all. Well, he's the world's first ever voiceover ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> Oh, sorry, ventriloquist figure. He'd like to introduce the winner for our on-air read of a review from iTunes. So, I'll turn it over to the little guy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Archibald Carlisle. Uh, get on with it, buddy. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, air yeah, time and all. Uh, so, today's winner from the iTunes review would be Horrified Paul. Is that good? Yeah, that, that was terrific, buddy. Okay, can I do my job now? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, it can get weird here sometimes. Anywho, Horrified Paul. What a stupid name. <laughs> you know, the other half isn't a prize winner either. Really? I'm getting chastised by a puppet here? Okay, fine. Uh, sorry, Horrified Paul. Great name. Anyway, he writes... This show has all the makings of a classic. The host is utterly fantastic, and the actors are too classy and professional. Can't wait to see what comes next. One of my faves, for sure. Now, he may be talking about that other guy, which you may be wondering where he is. Well, we're not really sure. Hey, Archie. Do you know what happened to GM? Uh, no, not at all. But thank you very much for that glowing review, horrified Paul. I'm sure GM will blush at your flattery. Now you'll need to mail us a screenshot of your iTunes account page with your screen name pictured to verify your account and send it to contact at simplyscarypodcast.com to claim your prize. Paul is right to shiver in anticipation. For what comes next. Remember, folks, you too can have your comment read on the air and receive ghoulish goodies, but only if you subscribe to us on iTunes and leave a review 
preferably one with five stars, and with more blood gushing comments about the host and the guest host. And the vent figure. Don't forget the vent figure. Now you can also support our creation of new audio experiences by visiting chillingtalesfordarknights.com forward slash patrons and signing up for a membership. For far less than you pay the cable company for channels you never watch, you get the highest possible quality audio recordings, including unreleased material, isolated music tracks, and short films, all available to download and play offline. For horror authors out there who would like their work adapted into Simply Scary style audio books, contact us at simplyscarypodcast.com or reach out to us at contact at chillingtalesfordarknights.com. We can provide you with a great opportunity to terrify new audiences at a competitive rate. Now, if you think your story is creepy enough for the podcast, go ahead, take a shot, submit it to us. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com forward slash submit dash a dash story and we'll see if your story is simple and scary enough for us to give it the treatment if you are interested in sponsorship opportunities or crossover promotional opportunities for your podcast business or event during our show click on the advertise link at the top of the page on simplyscarypodcast.com this is the other half of the producer jesse cornett in case you didn't know But I don't use that personality too much. Not quite abrasive enough. Yeah, you're telling us. That's enough out of you. But thank you for joining us for this very special election episode. Now don't forget to get out there and vote, folks. Remember to ask yourselves, listeners, are you really voting for the lesser of two evils? Or are you just trying to decide who best to inflict those evils on? We'll see you next time, when we show you once again, there is nothing simple about being scared. Unless it is, the Simply Scary Podcast. This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review comments or questions email us at contact at simply scary podcast.com and check our website for more information while you're there consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show copyright chilling entertainment llc 2016 thanks for listening chilling tales for dark nights